Welcome everyone. Very nice to see a uh, nicely filled room. And we have maybe some people even uh, in Alnarp watching and may maybe even in Uganda. The link has been sent out. Um, and it's a great pleasure to introduce Brian to you. Brian is a, uh, by training, a um, entrepreneur. I guess that is a, a business entrepreneurial uh, project management um, uh, background uh, from Uganda Christian University in Kampala. And he's currently working with the RAN Lab, the Resilient Africa Network, which is a network he can elaborate more about than I. But it's a network that tries to uh, use ideas and innovations that come from university and spin them off and scale them off uh, up in, um, in, uh, in business development. And that's not only in Kampala or Uganda, it's a network across 19 universities in Africa from what I understood. Um, and uh, he has been um, uh, from Granada for a long time. He was in the Netherlands for his RAN business and so I thought, well, why don't block him and get him and give him a seminar, give him the chance to give a seminar here. Brian and I met uh, in August uh, when we were uh, having a similar platform called Accelerate where we want to get youth engaged in developing agribusiness ideas and Brian has been very instrumental in, in propelling the whole platform um, and he is entrepreneurial by himself as well. He, besides his professional work as an uh, as an uh, innovator, he is also a restaurant owner in Kampala. He started this barista restaurant. If you're ever in Kampala, visit him. And some of you visit Kampala regularly, so please visit his um, restaurant. Now, this restaurant is really interesting because he integrates his innovation and and project management skills in not only utilizing the the, the restaurant for his own good, but also use this as a as a hub for accelerating business ideas and uh, agri business ideas, and that what that became sort of his entrance into agri business, and he will talk about uh, an idea that the, he would like to to scale up as well, and that's uh, urban farming, the potentials that are there in big cities to actually make gainful employment in urban farming, but also talk about the challenges that, that are uh, the, the um, knowledge and uh, innovation challenges that need to be overcome in uh, urban farming. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Good afternoon. <coughs> the room still you know, looks very serious. <laughs> I looked at the sign-up sheet and you know, it freaked me out a little bit. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, as a form of uh, breaking the, you know, the silence, can we just put our hands? <laughs> For the people that organize this, turn and Malin, you know, thank you very much. My name is Brian, um, and I'll talk more about myself. But I put sticky notes around, um, post-its. You'll see them around. And I want, I have a few questions. I want us to begin with a very short quiz. See how much we know. Mm. Oh. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, are we ready? Post it, pen? Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. We're ready? Yeah. All right. Yeah. What is the world population? The world population. How many people are on Earth? Make a guess, you don't have to be very accurate. <laughs> We're scientists, come on. <laughs> um, next question What percentage of the population in the world stays in urban cities? Can you guess what percentage? Make sure you note down something. What percentage stays in urban cities? Next question. What's the average age of the farmer in the world today? The average <laughs> farmer in the world <laughs> is how old? The average farmer? How many people go hungry every day? 
people who sleep on an empty stomach every day. Can we get them? We just had a very interesting, delicious sandwiches. How many are not going to have a sandwich today? Mm. And maybe just make it uh, more, more emotional. What's the child mortality rate um, caused by hunger, you know, uh, and its consequences? Per the, um, not in the world. Per year. Yeah, per year. What's the question? The child mortality rate caused by the consequences of hunger. We're good? Mm -hmm. Mm? All right, so the answer to the first question, you all know, right? How many people? Uh -huh. 7.001 <laughs> 9.6 9 .6 billion currently? I think it's about 7.2 billion. 7 .2. 7 .2. Yeah, around 7 billion. Uh, the percentage of the world that stays in urban cities? 65. Between 50 and 60, right? Yeah. Isn't it great? And those too many people in our urban cities, mm -hmm. you know, half of the world stays in urban centers. You know, you can imagine the immense pressure on all these resources in urban centers. And I'll talk a little bit more uh, of our run lab work in Ghana. And I will not mention the statistics, but um, we have all these papers on our website. You will see how many people per square meter are in in Ghanaian cities, uh, West African cities, because of urban, um, rural urban migration. The average percentage, the average age of a farmer, did you take a guess? 47. 47, huh? 55. I had a 50, right? Yeah. Oh, anything higher than that? 60. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I told you yesterday. <laughs> yes, 60 years. You know, the average farmer in the world today is 60 years. You know, someone who's doing very good production, uh, food production on the farm, and feeding a couple of uh, lives out there in urban centers and all, is 60 years. Uh, how many people go hungry every day? One billion. One billion. One billion. million. Yeah. <laughs> well, so um, you may be right, but when we condense it to urban centers, about 250 uh, 50 to 80 million every day in urban centers mm -hmm. more hungry. But when you scale yeah. it up to rural areas, yeah. yes, it can it stretch. It was a big UN campaign, I think. Yeah, it can stretch to one million yeah. hungry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the child mortality rate, did you take a guess? Anyone except Decker? <laughs> <laughs> yeah? 10 million was my guess. 10 million. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll give you um, per child and then you can compound that. Okay. Yes. So one child uh, under five years dies every 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, from malnutrition and undernourishment. Mm -hmm. And I have. Just a few more um, that I also um, found interesting. 820 million people um, in developing countries, yeah, in uh, developing countries, are from you know also sleep hungry, and 427 million of these live in African urban cities, you know, where food does not reach every person in these cities. And you notice that I have an interest in urban cities. Um, and then, of course, in Kampala, we have 1.5 million people, you know? And I'll speak a little bit more in Kampala. 
this is information that I got to find out when I started doing some, you know, uh, bits of urban farming at my place. Uh, because for me, I thought it would be good to understand what I'm going to go into. And when I looked at how big uh, the market is, I also found how big these numbers were, you know. And it was uh, very coincidental that in the same period, I got to be a part of Accelerate, which opened a lot of my interest in um, sustainable agriculture, especially in urban cities. So those are my two names. Um, I have a background in entrepreneurship and project management from Uganda Christian University, uh, which is a bit slightly over 10 years old in Kampala, uh, in a place called uh, Mukono, which is uh, towards the falls, the, the river Nile. Um, and for the last five years, I've been working uh, with and in innovation hubs and innovative projects. Um, both in Kampala and in those countries that I list down below, uh, Kenya, Tanzania, Rwanda, and most of these places, uh, especially the different countries, I'm working with projects themselves, you know, uh, but also with the linkage to the innovation hubs in these countries. My uh, affiliation to innovation is business development and scaling, because that's, that's, that's my background and I like it so much. But in there I have interacted with a couple of other opportunities, you know, like building mentorship programs, uh, putting up the human center design curriculums, um, uh, you know, working on acceleration programs. And, and I enjoy the whole, you know, innovation field um, very, very much uh, because with my background, I have an opportunity to cut, you know, across very many uh, dimensions. So, like for the last one year, I've been um, working in a new field, which is legal innovations, uh, with a Dutch uh, organization, Hill Institute for Innovations of Law in The Hague, um, which is, past four months was a bit weird, but now I, I find it interesting to bring justice to people. and. You know, the challenges are always the same. Usually there's no sustainability model for all these uh, mm -hmm. innovation projects because they are very expensive for you to scale innovation, especially in uh, economies like ours. Um, and this is where I find, you know, Accelerate still um, very interesting and uh, sustainable culture also very interesting for me. And I'm recently married. <laughs> to my um, very loving and uh, you know partner in crime, uh, that's my wife. She's a software engineer uh, called Victoria, and together we run the coffee shop. Still from different worlds, you know, but uh, doing food, which is not entirely her background because she comes from a computer science background. But it's an interesting space for us uh, to be in food, and I think that we learn more when we are outsiders than when we are insiders. But this also gives us opportunity to push you know, the, the boundaries of people who have been in there. In Kampala, we are, I think, the youngest business owners of a business like ours, a coffee shop and a restaurant, because it's very expensive to set up, but we have it and every day we don't take it for granted because they're very huge competitors uh, coming from Kenya, you know, as far as Kenya to enter the Kampala market. So we have to be innovative, which keeps us on our feet. We, by, um, I think by February, we we'll clock 15 full-time staff, you know, um, which, which increases how much uh, service we can give to clients. So that's me, that's uh, about me. This is Kawa to go uh, restaurant, and Kawa to go Kawa means coffee, then to go is, you know, the, the typical to go. Yeah, it's a restaurant and it's a cafe. Um, at first wanted to do a cafe, but then, you know, we decided to do the whole nine yards and do the food. 
We get beans from the eastern part of the country, um, fresh roasted beans, um, and we serve great coffee, you know, um, great robust coffee. We do fresh uh, food, and I know fresh is a bit relative, but for us, fresh is real fresh because um, all the food that we actually prepare is made, um, you can make. I want the mango, I want the pineapple, and we just blend it there and then, and you have it. And we thought that that um, will make our, our niche in the market, and it worked. And now we're scaling that into the food as well, because we've been purchasing food from um, the normal common markets, but we've found flows, and which is what leads us into uh, our agricultural project. This is our space. Um, very different, but also interesting because our, our clientele is not just the people who come in for food, um, it's also the people who are looking for spaces where they can meet. With our, ex with our experience in working uh, in innovation hubs, because he also used to work um, in one of the innovation hubs, <coughs> we, we create um, you know, a very fluid environment where people like them, this is a gathering for book readers. We are ardent book readers, so we have a book club where people always come in and they co-create the books that we're going to read and make sense out of that. <laughs> we have poets that come in every last weekend of the month. Um, poetry, some bit of rap. Uh, I'm getting used to the rap bit. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and this opens us to all these interesting ideas, you know, that are out there that if we decided to run just a typical business, would not have found. So <coughs> the world population in urban centers keeps growing, and I don't want to you know, make like a lecture out of this. But in Kampala itself, um, when we had started, the very first year we started, I used to buy the things in the market. So I got the market about 4 a.m. to make sure I get the very fresh products before the other traders take them. And as I kept interacting with the people who bring the food, um, I got to find out that Kampala receives, you know, up to 3,000 tons of food every day. You know? That's a lot of food, but it's not enough for everyone who is in Kampala. And it would have been enough if we have a way we can store it. So it's not enough because it goes bad very fast, you know. Um, the average shelf life is about three days, which is not good for business, you know. And also, these are the things that I found uh, in the market. Our urban population has grown, um, you know, almost by 10% now. And this is also an opportunity, but it's also a challenge. <coughs> it's a challenge if our young population, which comprises, uh, makes a lot of percentage of the urban population, if they're not employed, it becomes a challenge. You have more crime, you have you know, less disposable income, which becomes challenging for us who are in business. But still, when you see the numbers, I see business out of it. You know? <coughs> for urban uh, farmers that I have interacted with, for all the 3,000 uh, tons of food that come into Kampala, 35% is contributed by these guys. And the next picture will show you know, how they look like. Um, I also, from my experience in working with young people, there's also this huge extreme um, of young people that is not employed, you know, that goes up to 83% um, countrywide, but in Kampala alone, it's about 30% of all the people that are in there, young people are not employed. So I still see opportunity in there. And right before I met the Accelerate team, I was just getting to understand why aren't these people interested in agriculture? Because you get someone who has three acres of land back home in the village, selling the land just to come and buy a motorbike, you know, motorbike taxis are a big thing in Kampala. 
Yeah, border, border. <laughs> and yeah. this bike is stolen, you know, many times in less than a year. So you have lost all the resources that you have. So this guy has no job. He might as well become a thief, you know, something like that. <coughs> so this is a typical young urban farmer in Kampala. You can see right uh, in, the for in the background is a fence. You know, that's like someone's home on the fence. Um, so this guy has such a very small space and he's growing tomatoes, you know? Do you see anything um, that strikes your mind in this picture? Anything in this picture that looks a bit oh, weird? Oh. Not, 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 not weird, but uh, innovative. That is recycling the, the, the plastic bottle. Yeah, yeah, the bottles of water. Yes, it's very innovative, and I know our president, you know, recommended it as uh, one of the irrigation uh, methods. But it's very tedious, you know. So these are some. Of, this is one of the reasons why the young people will not go into agriculture, even when they have land. An average young person who is renting their home has between 20 and 30 square meters of space out of their, of their, of their room, uh, like a balcony or something like that. That's enough space to do so much, you know? But if I have to do this every day, then it becomes tedious. If I have a, you know, a job, maybe I shift somewhere at, at Kawa to go and I do about eight hours, I don't have time for this, you know? So I can make extra money. These are uh, things that I found when, when uh, the people that I visited and the young people that I spoke to. This is one of the best urban farmers in Kampala. Um, and this is her space. It's great. She's doing so much. She has done a couple of trainings. But when I saw her space, I still saw something that, you know, um, was like, for me, it was a uh, resources that are not maximally used. If you look at how she manages the space, the big sacks, I feel that we can grow more food in that space because she also has about 30 square meters of space uh, where she grows a good number of uh, kilos of food every month. So all this is good, but why am I here? I think that we can make it better, you know, and still Maybe because I'm not a farmer by background, that's why I keep challenging all this. Because when I spoke um, with people like her who already have these farms, you know, they're not willing to change because that works for them just right, you know. <coughs> this is our typical market. So those purples will go for four days maximum. And if they're not sold, that's food that is lost, you know. Also because everyone grows and takes to the market, they don't know who is going to come and buy. Obviously they know a couple of people like me who buy every day, but if I've already bought in the morning and they don't sell, they don't know who else will buy. But when you interact with the business people, uh, being in my business, I've interacted with over 15 uh, very good Kampala chefs. Um, one of the, our challenges as business owners is consistency product consistency. And when you do a reverse engineering of how the product comes to be, it's how it's grown. It's where it's grown, how it's grown, um, maybe not so much about the seed, but how all that process is managed. So what if we could solve this right from the background? Um, and then I know that if I have 20 square meters, I grow this and this becomes my specialty and if I'm supplying Sheraton in Kampala, they will know that I have a very consistent product. So like a big, a good example of a product that we use that now grow ourselves is mint, peppermint. It has, like in a year you'll find it like two seasons when it's, you know, it's very accessible in the market and then it will disappear. So you begin to have all these types of mints. And most people don't know them, but in Kampala we have five types of meat, you know, after doing research. But the kitchen, the kitchens in Kampala, or I think everywhere else, we use peppermint. So
So if there's someone who knew that the kitchens only use this and there's a standard size of the leaf that we look out for, that would be business. Mm. You know? So that's my questioning of sustainable agriculture, uh, especially in Kavala. <coughs> my wife comes from Kavala, and once in a while we visit the space. And for me, this picture gives me the ideal situation of, of residential areas in Kampala. We are all, you know, uh, split into small plots of land and spaces. And the question is, if we reach this level where we are now, you know, um, what's the word? Everything is finished, the point of satiety, right? Where else do we go? Because we can't go, um, Horizontally, we can either go down or up. And I think that going up can work for us. And <coughs> these are some of the things that are the challenges. Post-harvest handling, inconsistency, this usually affects the businesses. Um, lots of chemicals being used. Uh, this is a bit technical for me to solve. Uh, being able to deal with people's chemicals, it's also a lot of perception uh, that's you have to spray everything that you use. Mm -hmm. So what did we do? What uh, is our solution? We grow our own food in the space, you know, in the eating space itself. We began by growing herbs, but we wanted to test um, if it would actually work. So I actually have pictures without the labels. Uh, and we put those labels after one month. We put the food, uh, the, the herbs, and people would come and sit to them if they are like flowers. Only those very few who knew them would pick them. When we put the labels, everything changed. People started building small conversations. People would come and order for tea and uh, break the leaves without looking, but you know, we have cameras, so you'd see them break the leaves, <laughs> you know, and drop into their teapot. And that communicated something to us. Up to now, we have not yet started charging for them using this. But if you come and say, I want to have meat in my tea or food, we'll give it to you. But we'll not charge for it. You know? Because we're, we're still in a testing phase. So that communicated that if people understood their food, it would actually be a very good experience. You know? And this led to us now going back home and making something uh, a little bit bigger than we had. So we looked at the vegetables that were giving us a bit of a problem, um, and we decided to grow them, which now actually exposed us to all these questions that I've been asking and all this information because things did not go right. We made so many mistakes. But this land, you know, just at the upper side is, is, is our house. This land down is about 28 square meters, you know? And the lady in blue is, is a soil scientist, you know. She also does um, green farming, but her specialty is so, uh, soil science. Um, and she gave us the soil that we've been working with. Uh, she, there's a way she steams out all the germs and bacteria using, you know, normal heating, and then mixes the manure. And, um, and we don't have to spray. So we grow all our crops without spraying, which I find very interesting. <coughs> and that's our garden, mm. you know? Mm. Going up, that's our garden. We have 100 gardens, those bags, 100. Um, 12 varieties of herbs and vegetables. Uh, we use less than 20 liters for irrigation on all the gardens you know, every day. Um, no spraying, no artificial fertilizer, and we have more space for 200 gardens. Mm -hmm. That size, you know? But, um, what, why am I still uh, not, I'm, I'm not yet um, satisfied, because there's still more room to go up, that's number one. Number two is um, a typical, plant like meat or celery, you know, doesn't need, that bag is about 10 kilos of soil. It doesn't need 10 kilos of soil, you 
no? So when uh, I met uh, Deca, that's one of the first questions I asked him. How do we make um, this kind of agriculture very sustainable? Because in my thing, uh, I'm convinced that if we make it very easy to set up such gardens, um, I have been working with the lady to, you know, package the soil and make it more accessible because at first she was doing it, you know, for her own garden. And I told her, I will buy if you package it. So she got the bags and she thought I was kidding. So I bought 100 first time. So if we access some of these things and then to the young person in town, we say you need maybe $150 to begin your agriculture project. Everything is already worked out for you. All you need to do is plant. My interest in all this is twofold. Um, the market for everything that is grown and to see more young people getting employed. The science is why I'm here, is why we have this uh, very close friendship with, uh, uh, with DECA and SLU. Because I think that one of the things that is already happening, uh, but maybe it's still a bit complex, is the research and how the research is packaged, especially for a young person who is a little bit devastated because he's, he cannot find a job. So they may not take in all this research. For me, this is almost one year of trying to test this. Mm -hmm. For this person, they only have like one month of excitement and you know, it will die out very soon. So in that one month, how do we get it up and running? You know? <coughs> so yeah, mine is a single story. I think it can be replicated. What are the opportunities? Um, I think that research in urban farming is there, but I think that we need more business-led research on how to make it, you know, uh, a potential. Landscape design for urban farming. <coughs> um, I know that there is, I have looked up a, uh, a map of Kampala that shows all the spaces that have been allowed uh, for farming in Kampala. Most of these spaces, especially where the food comes from, are the ones that have water drainage issues. Very heavy population staying there, animals and people and then the gardens. So to me, that comes out as a design problem. That if you can get landscape students, and that's why I'm excited you know, for, the, for the session in the south at Alna, if you can get design people to actually take a look at this, um, that's a very good opportunity. Business acceleration, and that's where um, uh, ac the Accelerate program comes in. When I attended the program and I did a session there, I was very excited because this is another opportunity. So when we raise this excitement for this young person, we then take them through how to run the business. You know? <coughs> and value chain opportunities this is something that we were talking about yesterday. Uh, because if you split all this into very tiny pieces, you have someone who is doing irrigation that becomes value addition. You have someone who is doing maybe the, the, the planters and their unique design that's value addition. You have someone who is packaging this food uh, once it's out of the market. And we're talking about very lean kind of packaging, food packaging, not something that is expensive. And I know that you may think about hydroponics. Uh, I have been to two hydroponic farms. Still, I have done some research because we have some Israeli uh, group of farmers that are doing some hydroponics, uh, great hydroponics in Kampala. But to the typical urban farmer in a developing country, hydroponics is expensive. You know? And also because the market is not well defined to see who will take on this food. So, this <laughs> is one of the starting points. This collaboration between the North and South, and one of the best things that we can take out of this collaboration is research infrastructure, you know? But the research has to be consumable. And, and we have great universities in Kampala, but our research is a hard nut to crack, 
you know. So, so ha if we can have very good research infrastructure, that can propel more people into this space. Um, I want to end with one of with this picture. This is a close friend of ours. Um, they supply honey to the coffee shop. And I'll end with what June talked about. When we started the coffee shop one year, we, we now have a, a, you know, a record of what we consume uh, you know, in as detailed as every shift, which is about eight hours, and how much. And we consume um, about 10 liters of honey every week. So we, uh, and we started with the notion of if there's any friend of ours, personal friend or people we have met, especially if it's a young person who is doing anything that can tie into the business, they have first priority to supply the business. So this guy, we're having tea at my place and he finally says, by the way, I pack honey, <laughs> you know, in a very funny way. And I said, you're joking. He said, yes. I told him, okay, bring it tomorrow. It had a name, but it was not this branded, you know? But it had a name. Uh, no license, no, you know, uh, like uh, any business thought around it, nothing. But he had the hand. And I told him, well, we're going to give you three months of probation. We take 10 liters of honey every week. Can you handle? And he said, mm -hmm. yes. He was a bit scared. So it's almost a year now. This guy now, um, obviously, he still gives us the honey, but now he supplies um, about 250 liters of honey every week to many other people. He has a fully registered business. It's, um, it's licensed. He's a winner for one of the African Entrepreneurship uh, Agripreneurship Awards. And because he has gone through our form of acceleration. You know, even the, uh, the award that he won this year, which gives him a 5,000 uh, seed funding, is something that we had applied for three years ago, and it came back, and I'm like, hey, you have to apply for this. I was like, I don't know how. I said, well, you have the business, so we will take you through it. And my wife, you know, because she's a mentor in there, so, you know, men mentored him through, and he's done it. We have done this for, I, I could not, let me see, We've done this for the lady that um, gives us, you see the red cushions on the chair, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the lady who makes that, young person, uh, fresh graduate, she does that. The person who made the furniture, young person, fresh graduate. So this is the acceleration that we are talking about. Mm -hmm. This is how accelerate, we envision it to work. Mm -hmm. That one business can accelerate many more other businesses, right? So as I end, what's my call? I know that SLU is a very great university. I have moved around. I have done my research. Um, I, one of the things that I think that would really uh, come in handy is uh, the collaboration, north, south, through the Accelerate program, you know? Yeah, so, and obviously I'll be, Happy to host you guys, you know, like I did with the team. This is the Accelerate team this year uh, mm -hmm. at the space. So it'll be interesting to host you guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, what's really interesting here for for me as a scientist is how is a embroidered on knowledge that is already there. And we were, as scientists, are so easily sort of in our own research bubble. Well, how to translate it into innovations and to make actually uh, sellable products out of that and how to accelerate that knowledge into something that can change uh, a life wherever that may be. That, that is, that's sort of the, the thing that's really interesting here. And so I think as a scientist, it's nice, it's nice also to to engage in sort of these, these sort of platforms, and we have our own platform. I would like to point uh, out a green um, innovation village or park. Park, park, it is, yeah. where these sort of ideas can be propelled out as well. So many sites have very good ideas, but lack generally the business skills or have too much of a hurdle 
see, seeing in front of them to actually accelerate these sort of ideas into businesses. So I'd like to point that out here as well. We at SOU have such a hub, but we also should think more globally and try to accelerate businesses on a global platform. So that's, uh, that's why Brian came in here as well, and I'm sure you have lots of questions. So please fire off. Yeah. Let me start because I'm going to teach in a couple please. of minutes. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Brian. Yeah. My name is Sophia. I'm also from Uganda. Yeah, and uh, I'm a rural developer. Uh, I'm a agricultural economist by training, but a uh, rather frustrated economist because I have problems understanding economic di discipline these days. My question is centered around acceleration and trickling it down. Yeah. Uh, the majority of rural Ugandan or young Ugandans are rural populations. Uh, your brilliant ideas and, 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 and your networks across, across the world, have you thought of how best you can make a north, I mean a south-south cooperation or acceleration instead of a north-south impact. For instance, you are up in Kampala having a south connection with Arua or Moroto or yeah. Gulu because these are also very fast urban growing areas. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I would be, uh, I would love to hear more around that. Yeah. And then two, mm -hmm. I'm running away. Yeah. Two, <laughs> um, <laughs> this issue of uh, young people, I mean, youth unemployment in Uganda, mm -hmm. you know, it has been ongoing for the last four decades. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and every year, I don't like stat statistics and I don't like figures because they really depress me. And, yes. and, and uh, sometimes I don't know whether they give me, the, they tell me the truth or they just lie. So the, what is the role of the Ugandan state really in solving the problem? Are there policy documents, agendas, you know? These are things the Museveni's, the peers of the world in Kampala, they know it. They see it every day that, you know, 80% of the population are young. Our graduates are not, you know, getting employed. One gets a master in agronomy. He's selling MTN cuts in Kampala and we clap because that is innovation. Honestly, in, yeah. a, in a country that is agricultural based, is that fair? No, it's not. Okay. Uh, I can quickly respond before you leave. Yeah, thank so you. So that's why for me, I am also not very convinced with the drip irrigation, mm. right? I, I think that it's not scalable. If you're going to airport, actually, there's a small, f as we bend into the airport gate, mm -hmm. yeah, there's a small farm there with this drip irrigation. Mm. I, I don't know. <laughs> it, I, it pisses me off. This cannot work, you know? Because they don't understand the young person. The young person is very dynamic. They want to have their life. So how do you live your life, but also, you know, do something on the side? And this comes with designing for the young person. At the, uh, at the green innovation space, we're talking about design thinking. Mm -hmm. I have done over 25, you know, of this, which leads me to your, uh, your, first, co uh, your first question. Mm -hmm. So my answer to the youth unemployment, what's mm -hmm. the role of the Ugandan state? I don't know. I, I think that they're not doing their job and I really don't want to think about it because it, it's annoying. So the best way um, to solve it is to do something like this and make sure that you're very good at it. Every employee that we hire is not above 25 years of age. Mm -hmm. It's deliberate that we hire young people. When we hire them, we give them obviously terms of reference but one of the things that we also give them as a mandate is you have to create a new product as an employee. It's a must. So we give them access to the internet. When I go back to Kampala, I'm setting up a learning lab. It's not there now, the Ugandan businesses. But this is how you facilitate, you know, the next job. Because this person gets inspired to do something else. And we allow them to leave. If you feel like, yeah, now I have, I want to go and do my job, you can leave because we have given you that platform. Mm. How do we trickle this down? Last year we did something that uh, I found interesting. I was also learning. It's called community capacity building, you know, CCB. It's a form of design thinking, but for the communities. It's a reverse engineering that instead of actually making all these solutions in the urban centers, there are also solutions in uh, the rural areas. Mm. So. You only have to identify challenges around this kind of um, design in the communities. 
and then obviously once you have found them you have to accelerate them with more uh, research from universities like this and we've been doing this uh, at Brazilian Africa Network in communities that are hit by mudslides mm -hmm. uh, like Bududa in uh, the northern area in, pa in uh, Padel I was there in communities that also have um, challenges with irrigation and, and water. And these guys have interesting, very rural innovations, but definitely cannot scale. It only keeps in the, in the ladies' compound. Mm. Um, I can point you to an organization that I also learned this from, and they're in Kampala, and they're local, mm. and they have a catalog of over 50 local innovations. You can imagine a chips cutter made out of wood. That's mm. like ancient technology, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but these people also do chips, fries, in the rural areas, and they sell, you know? Maize shellers, made out, uh, handmade. I have some pictures of us being taught how to make these maize shellers. Mm -hmm. But what becomes a challenge here is scale, you mm -hmm. know? So this is accessible, but I think that we need to first have more disposable income, more people making money in <coughs> urban centers because this money always finds its way back there. Um. Uh -huh. So you're, you're encouraging rural urban migration? Urban rural migration. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you know, what's funny is that when someone does this small farm and it works mm. and they've made some money, mm. it's very natural that they want to go and buy bigger land. Mm. And where's mm. the big land? Mm. Out of town. Mm. So, I don't mention that, but that's one of the consequences of when this, mm -hmm. when a small farm succeeds, people want to go and buy big land. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Oh, you have to have And you speak to Ghana? So, how can you, I think it's awesome, I'm going to be in Kampala four times, so I know how it's, how it looks like and yeah. everything. How could you implement this? Or how could you start it up for our people in the slum areas, for example, where there is so limited space? Yeah. How do you see the opportunities to do this there, kind of? So, in, in, um, I have interacted with people from KCCA, mm -hmm. Cooperative. Usually in every region, there's some piece of land that usually is reserved for the, for the authority, right? Mm -hmm. But they never have something great to do with it. So you find people grazing animals from there, you know. And I, I'm inspired by um, there's a Chinese project that I saw on YouTube where this guy was making use of, of such public spaces. You only have to lease it, you know, and, and make good use of it. But before you go to KCCA, I think that it's very good that you have something that is going to work. Because uh, if you interacted with our government services, you notice that it's very bureaucratic to get something passed. Yeah. So once you have something that works, because KCC is also looking for things that can bring uh, output out of the community that lives in Kampala, they will take it up. And uh, for example, for me, once some of these answers are, uh, one of I, some of these questions are answered, I have already identified some spaces in Kampala that I want to go and ask for. I'll give you an example. If you drive around Kampala, you have noticed these guys that grow flowers, mm. you know? Mm. Those spaces are given to those people mm. because to KCCA, it's part of the city beautification. And that's why when they are making roads and all, they always leave, you know, all that stretch of land. Yeah. yeah. And they relocate them there by themselves. So you're growing flowers? Ah, okay, we'll give you space on this street. Yeah. So mm. what if we actually grew what if it works? Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. It's a great opportunity for mm. most people. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking in relation to roadside uh, production. Uh, what about the pollution aspect then? I mean, I can understand if you're buying a plant there uh -huh. to a garden uh -huh. compared to if you're going to buy food. Yeah, so um, <coughs> it reminds me in October when I was at the World Bank Forum. I had so many questions around, um, what is it called, soil pollution and all that, and that was food safety, yes. food safety yes. <laughs> and that was, uh, I knew the food safety of the kitchen, <laughs> I didn't know the food safety of the soil and all, um, and that's something I've been working on. 
So the road, definitely, we are not as as uh, we don't have as very good health um, or healthy environments like maybe you guys do here. Yeah? So it will be a bit of a stretch. But in residential areas, especially not in slums, there are quite decent pieces of land that are not being utilized. Because you know, um, they, the lifestyle of developing communities, especially in our countries, people like to have all these assets that are not being utilized. It's a show off kind of thing, which is fine. If I can hire your land and grow in it, for me, that works for me. I don't have to buy the land. And this is where most of these spaces are, you know, in all these residential areas. And they're the ones that I think that can be utilized, uh, you know. And that's why I highlight that one of the problems that we have is the congestion um, and poor hygiene uh, in the spaces that are close to the city. Because for to do a very good uh, agricultural business, you need food travel time of at least an hour. No, at most an hour. Mm -hmm. you know? um, any normal business person who is buying from you will be able to wait for about two to three hours. So one hour is very good. And one hour is doable around Kampala and its suburbs. You know, to find spaces like that. Yeah, so we don't have to be very close to the road. Yeah, uh, Brian, thank you. Yeah. Um, Basil from Guru University. Uh, it is interesting to look at uh, the perspectives of uh, urban farming. Uh, but my question is about, uh, because this is intensive, if you look at it in every aspect, in terms of labor, in terms of whatever resources, but if you're going to produce from this system, and then your product is competing with this other product that came out of the extensive system, uh, the, the economics may not, because as you know it, if we are all, our product is all ending up, let's say in Nakasero, mm -hmm. and there is no differentiation, then we are facing the same price. So that is kind of a challenge to me. How do you look at it? So. I, I don't think that I'd actually aim for Nakasero, no, because I'd be shooting myself in the foot. Um, the first thing that um, I am taking out is making sure that the, this person who is growing the food has a defined market, you know, because in Nakasero, it's too much chaos to be organized. That's <laughs> number one. <laughs> yes, it's too much chaos to be organized. So. But there are businesses that are already organized. And I think as a farmer, that's what you're looking for. Someone who is going to purchase, like we do for the honey, like we do uh, for the guy that gives us the mushrooms. He knows that every Thursday he's giving us mushrooms, you know, five kilos, and that's it. So you want something that is that organized. So once that is done, and that list is already there, I already have it because we always communicate with these kitchens, um, and the hotels, you then have to work on this side. These guys want consistency. If you can do that in the growing, then you solve that. The other thing um, is shelf life. In Nakasero, that's the problem. Uh, at RUN, we have a startup that is working on eco cold rooms using um, air tight walls to keep the cold. So you run an AC for one day and you have cold for seven days, you know? And she's going mm. to put these up in markets so people can rent. Mm. Just increase shelf life, you understand? That's one way of organizing the markets. Mm. But mm. I don't want to go in that space. It has taken her two years. I don't want to go in that space. But if you have a way that you grow the food and you know that it's consistent and it can increase the shelf life because most of these, like the tomatoes, we actually have garden tomatoes. We don't have real commercial tomatoes in Nakasero. Mm. The people who grow them, they either sell them to ShopRite, which is a South African farm, or they export them. You know? Mm. The normal average customer will not know that information, that the actual longer shelf-staying tomato is exported out of Uganda. They have no idea. 
So the tomatoes we have in the market, these are just seeds that someone grows, <laughs> throws, and you know, you understand. <laughs> so that's something I really don't want to go in that Nakasera and organize it. But my interest is in all these young people because they have the ability to learn. Package this research in videos, and you will see how much, uh, how much it can change a young person's life. That's how we have been able to do so many design thinking mm. uh, you know, trainings, because most of this stuff is done in video format. Mm. Mm. Sounds good. Mm. Is there time for questions? Mm. Um, hi, thanks for your interesting presentation. I'm from the social entrepreneurship and innovation uh, uh, field, and I'm thinking the biggest question for startups is funding. Yeah. Do you, how do these young, um, Agripreneurs fund to start up their business. Is there a model to get loans or or to continuously find funding for all the inputs they need? <coughs> so, in the last three four years, government has provided funding, and uh, for I have also you know benefited from the funding. Like I've gone out to look for it. For me, I've gone a little step further to interact with the banks that have taken out the funding, that are dispersing the funding. And the biggest challenge definitely is people being able to pay back the funding. When you go back to the visitors, to the businesses that they invest, that they gave the money, there's no business model around it. It's someone who says, I have an idea, I have two acres of land given to me by my father, I'm going to grow this, but there's no business model. It's the typical case of I plant tomatoes and take to Nakasero. Mm. But this is the season when everyone else has planted tomatoes to this mm. and there's no food storage so you know, your plane goes nose fast. It's the same thing. The funding is accessible, but they just need to be prepared to get the funding, which what which is exactly what Accelerate will do. For me, out of working with all these many youth uh, projects and ideas, I think that we can begin with very little funding resources. Something like $1,000. Go and begin a small business using $1,000. We use the designing thinking model of do something small, maybe have just 20 gardens. Produce, make your $500, invest 300 grow the business. You know, it's exactly what we have been uh, doing with our startups. And even, I, and I make sure I try this in my business first. You know? So I, I don't preach what I've not done. And it works. And I think that in a market like Uganda, yes, it would be good to have very big funding. I also think that, and this is where my Ugandan youth will shoot me dead, but I think that we probably don't need a lot of money. We just need to first test the concepts first which you can do with very little money, you know, which is exactly what the funding that the government is doing. Between 1K and 5K, that's enough to start a business in Kampala. What we need is very good business models, you know, to make a good conducive environment. The funding is there, both in and out, it's there. Mm -hmm. One last question. I was curious, those uh, young people that you have worked with so far, mm -hmm. do they have a background in farming from, like, I mean, their families, or are they urban youth who have seen this as an opportunity to diversify in the farming? So the guy who gives us honey is a lawyer, and he litigates five days a week, you know? <laughs> yes, but, um, and because I grew up with him, I know that he didn't do any farming, um, but you see, because we have worked with him, my wife and I, he finds it much easier to monitor his business. You know, when he started hitting 150 liters, I told him, bro, man, you need to find a way of delegating this work because you're beginning to delay our, our supply. We're going to cut you off, you know? So grow your structure. And he has done that, you understand? What we are testing with the Open Sustainability Institute is a partner uh, of, of the Accelerate. Is the same thing that we are discussing uh, with the World Bank. How do we bring in more people who don't have a business background? Which is what pushed me to cut off everything that seems technical to the young person. 
you know, um, and make it so easy to do agriculture. Mm. So if I'm a typical young person, I walk in a store and there's this great planter which has maybe irrigation tubes and all, and all I need, to, and then there's this other person that has the soil and then, you know, and the market is defined. That makes it easy for me. But that's in my mind. It's probably marginal. You know, maybe not here, but in my country, it's imaginary. In my country, you have to deal with the sun and all that, you know, the, the, the climate, the rain, the soil, the pests and all that stuff. But there's this lady who is very good with her soil science, but we don't know her. So we have a fellowship program, uh, which is the Open Education Fellowship Program. And our second cohort, uh, which ends in February, we have different people. and. Uh, Deca was able to see the one who was in Kampala. We, have, we made sure that we invited different people from different backgrounds. We have doctors, like you people, but medical doctors, um, quite old actually. We have, um, <coughs> we have doctors, we have lawyers, we have uh, um, a young lady who is working on sickle cell, uh, software engineering and sickle cells. But we're doing business development program for agriculture. All these people have one passion that they share, agriculture, but they just don't know how to do it. So they're like, okay, we shall give you the business development scaling, we shall give you modules in sustainable agriculture, and the outcome is you have to grow your own food. Just have a little garden and grow your own food. If at the point you have more food than you can consume, you bring it to Brian. So we have a list of things that they can grow, which I know that we can consume as a restaurant. Anything that is above what your family can consume, you bring it to Brian. To Brian. And I was showing um, my colleagues uh, in the Netherlands, not too but I'll show you uh, the feedback that is already coming up, you know, which proves that doing agriculture is, is probably exciting, but it's this complex white elephant that people don't want to get themselves involved in. Which is why if the average age of the farmer is 60 years and we have more youth, um, especially in advocate countries, we need to find a way that we can get them into food growing or farming at all costs without making it very complex. It's the same question that I'm also trying to answer. Yeah, so we have 15 people now that are doing this. Um, the others are a case of I failed to get a job, uh, like the ones that I showed in the picture. Those are a case of I failed to get a job and they've been doing it for like five years, so they have like two, three years of their testing mistakes and all. But a typical youth doesn't need, doesn't, have, will not wait for two years of trying something and it's not working. If we want to bring them in in a very faster way, the environment has to be simpler is what I'm doing. Thank you very much, Brian, for, uh, for giving us. It's very inspiring. Talk.